Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Lead, Sell, Grow, the Human Experience podcast. If you've not joined the Facebook group yet, get your butt over to Facebook and join Lead, Sell, Grow, the Human Experience Mastermind. That's where we can connect, have good conversations, and enjoy each other. Would love to answer any of your questions. Today, I have an amazing, amazing guest with me. Um, seems like We've been finding some really good ones, but but Daniel Priestley definitely stands out. He is the founder of Dent Global and Score App. He's the entrepreneur of the year for 22, I mean, 2022. So you might be wondering, how did this guy become an entrepreneur of the year for 2022? We're not even halfway through the year yet. <laughs> That's how far ahead he is of everybody else. He is a four times <laughs> best-selling author, investor, and leading authority in funding, scaling, and selling businesses. He's also a guitarist and a father of three young children. Daniel, welcome to the show. That is the best introduction I've ever had. I don't know how I'm going to live up to that guy. <laughs> All right. So, so listeners are wondering, so, you know, the BS meter is up. They're like, okay, who did he pay for that 2022 <laughs> entrepreneur, you know, of the year award? Talk to us a little bit. How did you, what did you do to get that award? Yeah, it was a duffel bag full of cash. <laughs> and a few Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, well, it was it was look it was judged on a panel of experts, uh, fellow entrepreneurs, and a few uh, kind of professional service advisors. Uh, I was very it was really nice. Uh, we entered for another category uh, for business growth, and they selected me as the entrepreneur of the year. And it was down to the fact that during the pandemic, twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, we did some great hiring. Um, so we were growing through the pandemic. We spun out a tech company out of the core business, uh, did a series of acquisitions and opened up international offices. So um, I think the inspiring thing that they're looking for is just that during a time of pandemic, um, you know, we, we just kept pushing through and finding a way. We, we obviously got massively disrupted, um, but, you know, we had the kind of culture in the company to, to, to roll with it. And I think that stood out to the, to the judges and um, it was very flattering. Look, the thing about an Entrepreneur of the Year Award is... Uh, it's it's by definition it's going to have to be a great team um you know if you don't have a team then they're not going to give you entrepreneur of the year award and if you do have a great team it's the team who does all the work so i get to pick up the trophy and and they you know I, i'm surrounded by a very very good great amazing team um so the the award should immediately go to them um, absolutely as, and uh, shout out to rebecca hollis who's going to be watching this like i told you before she was incredible when setting up this interview and your team. I mean, that's a part of your team. I didn't know if you outsourced that or not, but she was amazing. And I found out that she is in fact, yeah, a she's, she's got a superpower. Great job. All right. So talk to us. So you started off in Australia, this, this wonderful accent you're hearing, even though the guy's in London right now, it's actually Australian for all us dumb Americans out there. And I could tell, I got to tell you my, my experience. So 21 years old, I was in Afghanistan. And we were in this Ford operating base and there were a couple of special forces groups there. One of them was from Australia. Yeah. These guys, these guys look like they're from the outback with the biggest beards, yeah. beer bellies, like just couldn't care less about anything and had the funniest story. So at night when we would come back, sit down by the fire, they would tell the craziest stories. Like the Aussies always have a huge place in my heart. But I, I've heard that. I've heard nothing but, you know, that, that, that same story of people who served alongside Australians. It makes me very proud. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it sounds cool. Really cool. They were awesome. And their, and their Hummers had more weapons on them than our helicopters. It was like the coolest thing ever to see. They're just wild. Anyway. Um, all right. So you started out in Australia, ended up in the UK. Tell us about your journey. Why did you leave Australia? How did you come to the, uh, how did you get to London? With a credit yeah, give, card give, and get to where you are now. I'll give you a fly through. I, um, when I was 19, I got to be part of a startup. I was employee number three before we had a business name or a business bank account. Um, I was kind of roped into a startup. And uh, the guy who roped me in was a great entrepreneur. And he, um, he built a company from zero to six million in two years. And uh, I, because I was number three, I literally was really close under his wing the whole time over those two years. And I learned just so much about business growth and entrepreneurship. And um, it could not possibly have been a better experience from 1920 um, to, to have that experience of working so closely with an experienced entrepreneur. 
Um, when we got to uh, two years in, I went to John and I said, uh, can I get some shares in the company? And he said, listen, if you want shares in a company, you've got to go start your own company. Um, we've outgrown you. You're, you're uh, hanging on by a thread, right? So what had actually happened is that <clears throat> at the beginning of the journey, I was a good generalist, uh, but the company had, had moved towards specialty roles and I wasn't specialized or qualified in anything. So he encouraged me to piss off, basically. Um, so I went and started my own company at 21 years old. And uh, we had some pretty explosive growth. I applied what I learned, uh, went from zero to 10.7 million in three years. So by the time I was 24, we were doing a million a month. We had a team of about 25, 30 people. Um, and, uh, and, and then my company had the opportunity to grow into the UK, into London. I set myself a very limited challenge that I would only go to the UK and I would turn up with a suitcase and a credit card. And if I couldn't get launched uh, by the time I ran out of money on the credit card, then I would put my tail between my legs and head home. What was um, the business? Uh, so we were specialists or uh, at the time we were specialists at um, introduction presentations or intro um, uh, introduction marketing, right? So if you think about um, businesses that would do well, by having a two-hour introduction workshop um, as a as a way of um, generating business, so we'd worked with financial planners, we worked with software companies, uh, I worked with franchise companies, and our specialty was the ability to do weekly presentations that were two-hour introductions. We were a marketing business focused on that, so it was called Triumphant Events, and the whole concept was around two-hour introduction presentations. Wow. Um, yeah, so we would run hundreds of these things and um, we would take a, a fee to do the creative. We would do um, success fee based on how much uh, business it generated. Um, and often we'd have retainers as well to cover marketing costs. So we had lots of different revenue streams, but it was a very effective way of marketing. So uh, basically we, we were just very much marketing specialists, specialists at a very niche type of marketing. Wow, very cool. Okay, so now you're in London, you have your credit card. How much, by the way, what was the credit limit for you for you to have to run out? Uh, look, <laughs> it was a reasonable limit, right? So Fair I built enough. a successful business. I think it was about 60,000 Aussie dollars. Um, so that would have been about 20,000 pounds, would have been about 35,000 US. Okay. So you Something got 35 like grand in available credit. You show up to London, yeah. talk to us. Uh, well, it's a fun story, and I'm glad you asked. I haven't thought about it for a while, but but basically, what happened is I put together a dinner, 28 um, people. I I looked for people in London who were established and and who were good um, good influences in the community, uh, and I put together a dinner. I said, I'm, I've just arrived uh, straight from Australia. I've never been above the equator, um, and I'm putting together a dinner. I'm paying for dinner, um, and I'd love to invite you as my guest. And I got a few of them to say yes. So then I would call some other people and say, by the way, this person's coming and that person's coming. So I ended up with 28 people at the dinner party. And um, uh, at the dinner party, I announced that I was, uh, I was setting up a business. I was launching a business. And, and would I be able to have a one-to-one -one meeting just to talk about our launch event? <clears throat> I ended up having meetings with everyone in the following two weeks. And I got their commitment to help promote my launch event. Uh, so we were basically going to have a, a you know, a big launch and um, everyone got behind it. And basically on the day that we did the email invites out to everyone's databases, um, I think about 800 bookings came in. Uh, we ended up having about 800 people show up to the launch events. We did 2 million pounds in the first six months. So it would have been about $3 million, something like that. Um, and um, and we, we were away. So we, we launched and, and the business uh, yeah, really took off. Uh, this was for the two-hour presentations. So, yeah. So what we what we've done is we, I'd secured a Singaporean company that wanted to launch into the UK, and um, and I'd secured them as our client number one to kind of come in and, and do the uh, the launch events for them, um, and, and and then we secured a company from Texas actually who wanted to launch in in London as well. So we started doing these um, roadshow events for, for overseas companies that wanted to launch in the UK market. So you were the outsourced marketing company helping these two organizations come into the UK. Yeah, yeah. And so when you reached out to these 28 organizations or the 28 organizations that showed up, what did you say to them? Like, what was the purpose of the dinner? <laughs> I, I said, um, 
we're having a, a dinner in Mayfair and I'm paying uh, and uh, I'm inviting all the most influential people that I can get my hands on. Would you like <laughs> it to come? <laughs> it was as simple as that. And you know what? It sounds extravagant, but realistically, I remember the bill was something like 1800 pounds. It wasn't crazy. Like it was, you know, it was, it was a dinner and a bottle of wine on the table. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like tens of thousands of pounds. It was a couple of grand, right? It was probably, you know, under $3,000 uh, to put together a high-end dinner and, uh, and get everyone enrolled. My goodness. So, okay. So you show up to a country where you know nobody, you didn't have any no, family nobody. or anybody. Don't know anybody. Never been, above the, never been above the equator. Never been above the equator. And how did you find, like, what research did you do to figure out these are the people you want at the dinner? Uh, I, there was a website called Academy, which was a online networking website. And they had a ranking system, uh, which was the highest ranking networkers in London. And basically they had like a, uh, th these um, these asterisks that went next to their name. So there was green, orange, and black asterisks, and the black ones were the ones that were um, considered to be the top most influential people on the platform. So I basically started with them, and then I just did some googling and and found you know people who had won awards and people who had um, uh, you know had, had run big events in the past, uh, and yeah. It, oh my gosh, I talked to so many. So many entrepreneurs who say, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what the next step is. I, I, I just don't know how to get people to talk to me. We're going to, gonna, off the back of this, we're going to have thousands of dinners. <laughs> Everyone's oh my gonna God, busy. I hope so. I mean, think about it. You call somebody just the sheer ego and say, I'm only inviting the most influential people in, the, in your city to a dinner. And you have a budget of, you know, 1800 pounds, what, three, 4,000 American dollars. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and you bring them to a dinner. <laughs> and yeah, then bring them to a dinner, private dining room. And, uh, and that was, that was it. And I wandered around. I booked a point over the, over the course of the dinner, I just booked appointments and uh, put them in the diary. And because I had bought everyone dinner, everyone just assumed I was like grand central station of opportunity. Now everyone was like, who's the new guy in town. And, uh, it worked. Oh you my know. gosh. You are the epitome of that meme. That's, that's like, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to butcher it, but it's like, you know, if there's no path, create your own, or if there's no road, create your own road. You just, I'm, you I'm just glad you chose that meme. I'm glad you picked that meme and not some horrible one. Was, no, no, but that's, like, that's exactly what it is. There was no road. You just showed up and you're like, I'm just going to host yeah. the dinner. <laughs> Have a dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay. All right. Daniel. Yeah. We're going to, I swear, we're going to get to talk about your companies, but there's a certain mindset that a guy has to possess to be able to, one, leave his home country, two, where you're successful, you were running a business. Yeah, yeah. Two, to show up to a brand new country where you know nobody, the only thing you got going for you is a similar accent to us dumb Americans, and you understand the people's language locally, and you just freaking invited a bunch of successful strangers to a dinner. There's a mindset there that a lot of people don't possess. Where did you get that mindset? Well, this is the thing. I, I was so, as I said, I was so lucky from 19 to 21. Um, I worked with an experienced entrepreneur and I was, I was really kind of like um, a fix it guy or, or a dog's body kind of guy. Um, I just, he would give me, he kind of thought of me as like a Swiss army knife, someone who could do 25 things badly, but just well enough, just well enough. Right. So I just got for two years, I just got thrown into go launch, go launch our, you know, cans office, go, go out to Bendigo and have a, see if that works and uh, run some ads in the newspaper and organize this event. So I was just kind of thrown into the deep end with a lot of stuff. And, and then, you know, when I built my first company, we, you know, it was a very fast growth company. So don't underestimate. I had a lot of confidence behind me just because um, we'd had had some real success uh, in the lead up to that. So, you know, it was zero to a million in the first year and then uh, one to one to 11 million in the following two years. So it was a very, wow. it was a very fast growth. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So now you're in, in London. Talk to us about Dent Global. Uh, well, Dent Global came later. So when I was first in London, I was I was running these businesses and um, we we're making great income and it was doing well. And then the global financial crisis hit 
um, and it was catastrophic. So basically the whole thing collapsed. Uh, I went from millions of revenue to a few hundred thousand of collections, collecting old money that was coming in. Um, but basically the business just, the wheels completely fell off. Um, our Singaporean company no longer wanted to come to the UK. Um, our uh, US company, the pound collapsed against the dollar. So they didn't want to uh, go and do the pound thing. Um, so we basically had our major sources of business completely stop um, when the global financial crisis happened. So I, I actually thought about, I'm going to sell the business here in the UK and I might go back to Australia. So I tried to sell the business and it was a disaster. Um, from £4 million of revenue, uh, the best uh, offer that I got was 300000 over two payments, 150 grand and 150 grand, right? So really, you know, distressed acquisition type stuff. And um, I, I hired a consultant to, and I said, why can I not sell this business? Like we did 4 million last year. I get it that we don't have a client right now, but we've got, you know, we've got the revenue and we've got the profit and all this sort of stuff. And I just didn't understand why the business wouldn't sell. And he said, look, your business is a brokerage model business. You're not owning an asset. You're working hard and you're getting highly paid but you don't own the asset. You're not building anything. And I went, oh, okay, what should I be building? He said, you've got to build assets. You've got to have your own databases, your own brand. You've got to own your own product set. You've got to be more than just a broker. So I was like fascinated. It kind of almost like just this flick, this light switch went on of like, I'm building the wrong business. Um, it's kind of like if you imagine... Uh, an Uber driver who's doing 16 hour shifts working hard and they think that like if I just keep doing more shifts I'll eventually become a millionaire and it's like no no this path doesn't end you know you're just you're not doing something that's building an asset so basically what I did is I decided I'm going to completely turn this around I'm going to keep the business I'm not going to sell it and I'm going to try and build an asset so I go through the whole process of reinventing the business repivoting the business figuring out what, what is our brand going to look like? What data are we going to collect? What position in the market are we going to have? What, what um, products are we going to develop ourselves? Intellectual property, media, software, like how are we going to build this thing together? And we, we just started kind of reimagining what would the business look like if we were not reliant upon bringing other people into the UK, but we owned our own stuff. Um, so that happened in 2010. And we created Dent, and Dent is a global business accelerator program. And we we got um, we built our own intellectual property, media, and software, um, and then we scaled that globally. So um, basically, opened up eight cities around the world. Uh, we uh, grew to three and a half thousand clients um, globally. Uh, we did seven acquisitions, bought up uh, a group of services companies that um, that serve the entrepreneurial market. Uh, yeah, and 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 kind of went from rock bottom to, to being a global business. So what service were you providing with Dent? Like why do companies want to join it? Yeah, so Dent is an entrepreneur accelerator. So we have a, a team of um, experienced post-exit entrepreneurs who do mentoring and coaching. We have a methodology that we take people through as to scaling uh, their businesses. Um, and we have uh, vetted suppliers. And essentially we do step-by-step -step growth. So um, taking companies that that want to go through a process of growth and, and development and 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 uh, growing those companies, um, but then what we did is we bought the suppliers. So we own our own publishing company now. We've got film production and media. We've got um, IT services. Uh, we've got PR. Um, so uh, we've got an ads company that does Facebook and Google advertising campaigns. So we went and bought up all the companies that plug in. And then essentially we've got the accelerator, which is the training and development side, and then the services which is the implementation side. Uh, and um, yeah, that's the, and today we've got our main office in London, Sydney and Toronto. Oh, wow. Great job. Congratulations. So, <laughs> thanks. so, okay. So you guys are doing business coaching. What's the, what's the main kind of mistakes that you're seeing entrepreneurs making globally when they're starting a business or running one? Yeah, the hardest thing about the times that we're in is there's so many things you could focus on, like you said a minute ago, that you could easily be, uh, you know, there's so many things you could do, you know, Instagram stories, oh, no, you need to be on TikTok, no, you need to be, you know, uh, getting a CRM system, you need to, you know, you need to hire a salesperson, you need to hire an ops person, uh, you need to win some awards, you need to write a book, right, so there's all these different things, so um, 
the, the big thing is, is that most people are very overwhelmed. Um, most people are not sure what is the step to, to go through. It's kind of like, I've, I've got three little kids. So when you tip those Legos on the floor and uh, you've got, if you don't have the Lego instructions and you just start bolting things together, there's no way you're going to come up with the, the end design. It's not going to look like the front of the box. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. so the, the, the insight that we had is that 95% of businesses are the same, exactly the same. And it's only this like 5% of creativity that the founder and the entrepreneur really needs to put a lot of attention into and then just model the same 95%, um, you know, and, and just go through the steps and the stages and, and just do some slight changes, which are, which are the, you know, the creative uh, piece um, uh, that, uh, that they should go through. So it's not so much what are people doing wrong because there's so much you can do wrong. It's just that there's a very, very narrow path of doing it right. Oh, wow. Never thought of it that way. So what's the first step in that path? Or like, I mean, is it, does it start with creativity and imagination? Did I hear you correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Ideation is a great part. So we just call that concept. So the concept is, is the start. Like, what is your idea? What is your concept? Like me, I made the mistake of coming up with a brokerage model concept. So I failed that first test of coming up with a concept that we could own and scale. Um, and most companies are going to come up with a bad concept. You know, if your father owned a fish and chip shop, you might think, hey, maybe I should own a fish and chip shop. And, you know, straight away, you're going to spend all this time and energy on a business that just is not going to scale and is not going to be worth anything. So um, you could put just as much energy into a different type of business and it could be worth, you know, 10 times or 100 times more um, in the same amount of time. So choosing the right concept is important. Um, the next one is audience building. So building out the audience and, and finding people who get a high return on investment for what it is that you do, people who can justify a premium spend, um, you know, picking an, a niche audience or a niche audience. Um, and, um, uh, and, and that would be point number two. Point number three is um, about constructing a great offer, having, a, having an irresistible offer. And then point number four is sales calls, really great sales calls, like getting on the phones, talking to people and selling the offer. No websites, no social media, just whatever you can do to get face-to-face -face with the client and, and talk to customers and talk about, find out why they buy or why they don't buy, uh, what they're trying to get done in the world, what they're trying to avoid, um, you know, what they've tried in the past that did work or didn't work. You know, so it's that conversational sales. So, so that's the first layer. Yeah, so many salespeople believe that cold calling is dead. What's your, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I think cold calling is dead, um, but I do, but I don't necessarily think cold calling. I don't think it's cold calling if you're, uh, if you've researched the person and you've got a reason to get in touch with them. I don't think it's cold calling if they've in some way responded with you. Uh, you know, if they've filled in something or if they've connected with you on social media or something along those lines. Um, so I would, I would say that there's different, um, there's cold calling and there's cold calling, right? So, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Love it. No, thanks for sharing that. I think you're, you're definitely speaking my language. So how did we come to score the score app? Cause it was really <laughs> well, cool. I mean, you, you kind of demoed it for me before we hopped on, by the way, if you're on a call, check out score app, I'll have a link for you in, uh, in the show notes, but talk to us about how you came about that. Well, uh, in 2010 to 2013, we were running huge events all over the world. Um, and we were doing 600 person theater auditoriums. And one we did, did a couple of great ones with uh, in Tampa, Florida. And uh, so basically we would, we would just show up into a city and do these big five, 600 person events. And they were pretty cool. But at that time I was a bachelor um, and we you know, didn't have any kids. And then in 2014, where you know my my now wife and I were pregnant, and um, and it dawns on me, there's no way I'm going to be able to live like this. Uh, you know, with, with a little kid on the way, I can't be living out of suitcases and traveling around the world. And uh, this chapter of my life has to come to a close. So um, I, I I wanted to figure out how do we do? What am I trying to do with a big event? I'm trying to have warm leads. I want warm leads. To talk to i want my sales team to have hundreds of people that they can talk to and i want them to be excited to talk to my sales people so i'd seen this online personality test um which was uh which you fill in questions and it tells you what personality style you have and 
I thought to myself, what if we created something like that and, uh, and that people would fill that personality test or, or that sort of thing in? So we created a business uh, influence scorecard, a business influence assessment, and we put it online. It's called the Key Person of Influence Scorecard. Um, and 90,000 people filled it in, right? So it was just this, uh, when we launched it, it had a bit, of a bit of a viral effect. We ran some ads to it. We mailed our database about it. And then uh, we got thousands of people filling it in. And it had the exact effect that we wanted, which is that we didn't have to run events anymore. When someone filled in that scorecard, if they scored less than say 50% on the overall score, they wanted to talk to us about how to improve that score. They, they, they were very motivated to, they loved the questions, they loved the, the insights that we gave them in the report. And then they went, okay, I wanna get my score from under 50 to you know, 80 or 90%. <clears throat> So um, this, this was transformational. We didn't have to run events anymore. We didn't have to be physically turning up, spending 50 grand on, on promotions and, and events. Um, we could just run the scorecard. So this, from 2014 to 2020, we just ran the scorecard and talked to people uh, off the back of that. Uh, 2020, enough people had said to me, I wish I had one of those scorecard things that we said, hey, let's build a company around it, right? So we went and started our own company, um, using our own methodology, our own scale-up methodology that we teach. And we spun out a whole brand new startup. And, um, and yeah, it's basically scoreapp.com was born. Uh, we've had 2,000 clients in the last, uh, we've got 2,000 clients after the last two years and uh, $15 million valuation, 15 million, yeah, $15 million valuation um, and a uh, very minimal amount of capital raised. So it's, it's, um, it's a great, uh, it's, it's been a good validation of the, the, the method. Wow. Daniel, you're, uh, you're living the American dream in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the wrong spot. You're in the wrong spot. We need you in Florida. Um, <laughs> no, that's, that is great. So, okay. So just so people understand the score app allows a company and it's a membership model or like a monthly. It's, yeah. It's subscription. Subscription and it model. allows you to set up a, it allows you to set up a self-assessment, right? So your mm -hmm. book in the background there, B2B sales. Yep. B2B sales so, secrets, right? B2B sales secrets. So imagine this, imagine I read the book B2B sales secrets and I'm about halfway through and it says, uh, if you want to really get the most out of this book, take the B2B sales secret scorecard to find out whether you are applying the knowledge and then the scorecard will tell you where to specifically focus your attention. So I, I put the book down, I go on and I go B2B sales scorecard, I, I type in it and it starts asking me questions. Daniel, do you qualify your leads? Do you do this? Do you do, you do some calling? Do you do, do this? Have you built a sales team? Do you do onboarding, blah, 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 all right? All the things you recommend in the book. And I go through, I go, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And I get to the end. And it says your B2B sales secret score is currently 22%. Um, and here's, here's the 10 things that you specifically have to do to improve your score based on how you answered. And now, now I've got like, oh, wow, okay. I've, got, I've read this book and now I've got things to do. Now, here's how it works from your point of view. You right now with your B2B sales secrets book, you've got thousands of people out there who are reading the book and you have no idea who they are or the fact that they're reading the book right this minute unless they're emailing you or tweeting you or Instagramming you. Um, and you have no idea who they are. It could be a CEO of a NASDAQ listed company, could be a you know, brand new startup. You've got no idea who's reading the book. But as soon as they fill in that scorecard, you know who they are, you know exactly why they're, you know, where they're strong, where they're weak. Uh, you can respond very rapidly and say, hey, I noticed you took the scorecard. Let's talk about how to improve your score. Um, so they identify themselves and they don't just identify themselves with a little kind of like, here's my email address. They say, here's 50 things about me, uh, you know, that, uh, that kind of reveal who I am. So if that, were, if that scorecard was attached to your book like that, you could literally just give away a thousand copies per year and mm -hmm. just know that, hundreds of people are going to fill in the scorecard and those people right that day they're super hot hoping they read it so you got to put it in the first chapter in the first paragraph <laughs> yeah you you want to put a you want to put the bookmark in there as well right to get the most out of this book take the take the b2b sales secret score oh, i love it yeah take the quiz your market you're like a marketing genius it's like a top <laughs> of funnel you're getting to know yeah i put 
I created uh, some free giveaways, you know, hey, download, download the best questions to ask in the first meeting, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And so when I click, I kind of, I kind of get some of that, but I really like what you're saying because you can apply, you know, you can apply the score app to a lot of different businesses. I mean, imagine having insights before you have your very first meeting as an as a executive coach. And oh, executive coaches love this, right? Because you do a business assessment and then talk to an executive coach. Um, and then the coach knows exactly what, what your issue is. So, you know, let's say you had a scorecard and it measures sales management and operations. And you get a really amazing operations score. You get a great management score, but you get a shitty sales score. And that coach just picks up the phone and says, hey, look, you're doing really well with your operations. You can scale. You, you know, if I send you more clients, you can take them on. And they go, yeah, that's true. And you're really good at management and administration, but you're just not doing very good sales and marketing activity. That's what's, that's what's uh, your problem. And they go, yep, that's exactly my problem. Can, do you know how to fix that? I absolutely do. Right. So straight away, you're like in, in the first five minutes, you're having a really powerful conversation. We, we have um, cybersecurity specialists who do this, and we've got um, financial planners, we've got accountants, lawyers, uh, um, uh, we've got, uh, you know, property developers, you know, are you ready to sell your house? Are you ready to buy a new house? Um, are you tax efficient? Um, are, are, you, um, are you able to access government grants? take the scorecard, find out. Are you ready to um, expand your business internationally? Take the scorecard, find out. Um, are you ready to sell your business and or, or pass it on to your family member? Uh, take the scorecard, find out. So we've got all of these like thousands of scorecards that are just out there generating really crazy warm leads for people. And do you have templates? Like let's say I signed up, is there a template for an executive coach? that yeah. I can use or I have to create all my own and give them value. No, no, tw- there's, there's dozens of templates and it's all like written for you and you just edit it. You put your branding on, you put your, your, lo- your logo and your photo and your bio. Um, I would encourage people though, to, even though we've got great templates, honestly, the templates are a great place to start, but the people who do the best are the ones that sit down for an hour and do some creativity. They do some edits, they make it their own. You know, they, they don't just kind of like, plug and play they they customize um yeah, and it's don't even know to where to start right like i've never created a scorecard before i what if i'm missing certain questions how do i even know where to value that how many points to give to a certain question you know yeah well the template the templates give you a great place to start and then you could do some edits to make it your own um, we've got a help desk and a whole team who can help you we've got um, a monthly event called set up and score which runs twice a month where you just jump on and we, we literally troubleshoot right there. And there's always about 30 or 40 people on that. And we, we literally go in and, and improve your scorecard live. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, lot of help and support. I, I guess the key is just to, you know, to carve out an hour or two and, and just make it, you know, it's the creation of a new asset. You try like, you think how much time goes into creating a book. It's, you know, it's, it's a hundred hour project. This is a two hour project, uh, maybe a three hour project to, to get it nicely set up. Yeah, if marketed right and placed in the right place, um, you know, one of the things I've been doing, if I go to a speaking event and I'm the speaker and if I'm using slides, my last slide is a QR code and it leads to like, hey, download my presentation or, you know, connect with me or whatever. It's usually a free gift that's valuable to them, Mm. but I can... Hey, go to this scorecard, fill this out to know where you are. And bam, I just got yeah. all the lead. That's going to be more effective. And I'll tell you why. Because everything at the moment is broadcast, broadcast, broadcast. Hey, guys, you've just seen me speak for an hour. Now get my book and read my book. Now download my info pack. Now get this. And it's very one-sided. Um, so I'm receiving stuff. And that's cool. It's generous, right? You're generously sharing all of this great stuff with me. But imagine you meet someone and they're just talking about themselves all the time and they never say, tell me about you. Like, give me the, give me the, give me the, uh, you know, tell me about Eric, right? So when the conversation flips, right? And you start saying, well, here's who I am. I've got this business and we've got this many employees and we do this and we do that and here's that. And, and now we're having a two-way conversation. So 
The problem with social media is it's all built around this high idea of broadcast and everyone's broadcasting. So there's something like, you know, millions of YouTube channels and millions of, you know, uh, Facebook groups and millions of, you know, blogs. And everyone's kind of like shouting and saying, here's my stuff's better than their stuff. But there's hardly anyone saying, tell me about you, right? You know, so it, it's the person who knows how to ask the question, not give the broadcast who's, who's really able to capture the client now. Okay, so if um, if we got some listeners who are interested, give us three ways that they can effectively use this um, use your tool. So let's go let's go through a few ways. Uh, cold traffic into warm leads. So any form of cold traffic you've got, whether it be advertising, social media followers, um, subscribers, get them to fill in a scorecard. Make it short. Make it eight to twelve questions, eight to fifteen questions, um, really quick, less than a minute to fill it in. Um, and, and that's a way of basically going from email addresses or subscribers or ad advertising clicks to I've got some data about you. I now know something about you. What's the um, headline you would use? Are you ready to blank? Find out. Are you ready um, to blank? Find out. I, yeah. So Are you ready like, to grow example, your business? Are you ready to scale? Are you ready for a better relationship? Are you ready yeah. to get married? Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Are you ready to increase your B2B sales pipeline? Um, let's find out. Uh, so it's basically, are you ready to blank? Find out. Um, take the scorecard and find out. Uh, so that would be, or take this quiz and find out. So that would be number one. Number two would be if you've got warm followers, but now you want to actually book sales meetings. So let's say someone's been listening to a podcast for half an hour at the end of the podcast. Well, what's the next step? Take the scorecard, right? So that they've now gone from, you know, 30 minutes of listening to, Here's what to do next. You guys um, see how you know, Daniel's selling me on the scorecard thing, like sub subliminally. You guys see this guy's a master salesman. I love it. <laughs> I'm an animal, man. Like how, how am I, like I'm doing this subliminally to myself. Right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so basically you get to, you, you, with that one, you want to have 20 to 40 questions. You want to have more questions because you want to know, because they're warm. You want to you want to use uh, you want to give them a, a more detailed assessment because they're willing to dance with you. They're willing to play. Um, the final one that I really recommend is uh, if you've got a paying client and the first thing you do with them is a full on assessment, fifty to one hundred questions. Now here's the problem with coaching: it's intangible, and six months is six months to twelve months is what it takes to get a great result with a client. By the time they've spent six to 12 months with you, they start thinking that it's them who did all the, the, the change. And they also forget how shitty things were 12 months ago or, or how bad it was at the beginning. Very so true. what you want to do is on day one, before you've done any work with them, before you've touched their business, you want to be able to sell or whatever it is you do with them, their health, their fitness, their relationship. Before you've made any changes, you want to say, answer these 50 to 100 questions. They go through and they do a full assessment. And you want to ask itty bitty tiny things. Do you do this? Do you have this? Have you got this in place? Um, do you have this checklist? Do you have this measured? Do you do, you know, right? You're really going through. And then the idea is, is that they should come out with a score of like, I don't know, 15 to 30%, right? And then you just, over the course of the 12 months, you start checking off all the things that were on that list. And by the end of the year, they get to the end of the year and they can score 80, 90%. And that way it's unmistakable that that change, that transformation happened because of you. You were the one who identified all the issues at the beginning. You helped them check it all off along the way. And now you got them to a high score at the end. It's, un, it, it's, it's how they give you referrals. It's how they, they will literally go away and say, I, I went from a 17% to a 71% in 12 months. So they start talking that language and they show people the reports. Um, so that would be three ways I'd use a scorecard. Oh, I love it. And by the way, if you're in any kind of B2B sales and you're not doing quarterly reviews or semi-annual reviews, and a part of that review doesn't say, here's where we were when we started and here's how much you've gained and here's how much money you've saved and here's where you are today, year to date, you're missing a huge, huge boat make sure you start tracking it and showing it because those presentations, your guy, your person, your woman that you're dealing with may not be the final decision maker, but you want to give them a presentation that they can mm. take to their CEO to justify your service. 
And I guarantee you, if you make it easy on them, you're going to continue to win their business. But this is a great, great way to track it and a great starting point. Yeah, and you can't argue with it. Like it's, you can't. it's quite there. <laughs> yeah, it's a system. <laughs> I really like it, Daniel. Um, all right, what should I have asked you that I did not ask you yet? <laughs> uh your your questions are bang on um i i really have enjoyed this because we covered some stories we got into Likewise. some like tactics uh it's it's been good uh let me talk you through just a few ways of getting more people to take a scorecard okay um because that's always always useful um so things like they're good for ads you can run ads to scorecards and people fill in people go from facebook or google straight to a scorecard so if you've got an ads budget that works um joint ventures and partnerships I've noticed that there's a real pendulum where ads are really working for a while and then they, then they become too expensive and people switch across to doing joint ventures with each other. And what I mean by that is you mail your list and I'll mail my list um, about you. We'll, cross, we'll do a cross po- uh, promotion. Um, and scorecards are great for cross promotion because here's the thing. I don't want to email my list and say, you know, go and buy these $10,000 coaching programs from, from this company. But I do want to say, hey, this is a really cool online assessment. You should take this free assessment. Um, and then that's the gateway to, to, to recommendation. And if you've got a scorecard, you can do a joint venture with somebody else, um, which, is, which is a nice one as well. So there's a couple of, a couple of ways to get more people to promote. Uh, to, and you can, offer, promote. you can offer affiliate, affiliate commissions, yeah? So like, yeah. I go to podcasters who have a big list. If I want to, if I want to grow my executive coaching business or speaking business, I just say, yep. Hey, you'll get, you know, 10, 20, whatever percent. You could give them a percentage, or you could even say, we'll, we'll just give you 10 bucks for everyone who fills in the free assessment. Um, and that's the end of it. Uh, most people love that. Right. And, and actually believe it or not, it normally ends up cheaper. So if you said, if you said, Hey, we're doing a free assessment, we're launching it. Uh, we do ten dollars for every free assessment that comes through. It's it's we worked out that's what we we're spending on Facebook ads, so we'd rather spend with you. Wow! So you better make sure you have a good enough service to back it up afterwards, because people might take the assessment and still not do business with you. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, you were um, you were awesome. I absolutely love that conversation. Thanks for joining me. Before I go, what's the? I see you have a lot of books behind you. What's like top three for you? I, I love books. Um, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little bit counterintuitive here. I really want to encourage, and you, you would know this as well, right? I really want to encourage everyone have a go at writing a book, um, right? So reading books is great, but you know, I once met this. There was this woman who reviewed one of my books, and I looked at her website, and she was reviewing 150 books a year, and um, and you know, three a week, right? And I thought to myself, man, she's going to be a billionaire. Uh, you know, she's reviewing every great business and entrepreneurship book. But it turns out that she actually, she closed the business down and, uh, and she said, oh, I'm not making any money. And I'm thinking to myself, you're, re- you're reading three business <laughs> books a week and reviewing three business books a week and you've gone broke doing that. Um, so it shows that just purely and simply just reading books and lots of books is not where it's at. It's not going to change anything. But one thing, I've never met an author who regrets writing a book. I've never met an author who says that book didn't change my life in some way. Um, you know, the book becomes the best way to meet people at scale. It becomes a credibility builder. It gets you speaking gigs. It gets you consulting gigs. It gets you book royalties. Uh, if, someone, if someone lives across the other side of the country and they want to get to know your work, you just send them a book. Uh, so even though I could recommend a bunch of great books, honestly, the thing I recommend to everyone is have a crack at at writing a book i love it but besides that what are your three favorites <laughs> and i totally agree with you i'm just curious I'm, I, what okay. you're reading <laughs> okay I, I love i love ray dalio's principles ray dalio's right. principles when it when a 22 billion dollar man writes down in explicit detail here's how i do it you know you don't just ignore that uh that book um, i love the the book shoe dog which is the story of of how um, phil Nike. knight built mikey yeah. Um, that's great. There's two books on Steve Jobs. Um, one is terrible and one's amazing. So there's a terrible book uh, by Walter Isaacson 
which is just horrible. It says Steve Jobs is just a horrible guy. And then there's another book which his friends wrote called Becoming Steve Jobs. It's a great book and it shows how he evolved over time. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. Um, I like... Uh, I like Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. Um, so Jay has created like a very accessible uh, kind of mindset book around just like some monk principles of, of, uh, of meditation and acceptance, that sort of stuff. It's a great book. Um, and uh, this one was written by a friend of mine, uh, Sarah Milne Roche. She wrote a book called The Shed Method. And The Shed Method is sleep, hydration, exercise, and diet. And it basically says that if you don't have those four things in, in line, if you don't have sleep, hydration, exercise, and diet, you're going to make terrible decisions. You're going to make bad decisions and bad, you know, bad choices. And she gives you all the science behind it. And, you know, you can't read that book without really having a new appreciation of just essentially everything bubbles up out of the shed, uh, sleep, hydration, exercise, and diet. So there's a, there's a few. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much, Daniel. It was a pleasure to meet you and have this conversation. Wish you the best Likewise, of luck. Likewise, Eric. Friend. Loved it. <laughs> Bye-bye.